We open with hymn 312, Lord Jesus Christ, the living bread. our sins unto God our Father, 
beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant to us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou hearest me in iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The intro from Psalm 28. The Lord is our strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent, lest I become like those who go down to the pit. Do not take me away with the workers of iniquity, who speak peace to neighbors, but evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their deeds. Render to, render to them what they deserve. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, he shall destroy and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. Save your people and bless your inheritance. The Lord is our strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed.
fatherly goodness make your children to bear the cross and afflictions, to subdue our flesh, and quicken our hearts to faith and unceasing prayer. We beseech you through your Son who died for his nation, and to gather in one all who were scattered, have mercy upon us, and graciously deliver us out of all trials, so that receiving together the bread of life, we be raised from sin to praise you forever with all the saints. Through your beloved Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, world without end. Testament lesson from Moses, Exodus chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. But they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Here is the Old Testament lesson. <coughs> The scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land of the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hand to iniquity. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Our epistle from Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 21. After the epistle and the gradual respond with the sentence for the Passion season on the top of page 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, 
the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Here ends the epistle. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Peace be upon Israel from this time forth and forever. Christ hath humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Please, please stand. The Holy Gospel, written by St. Luke in chapter 22, beginning at verse 54. Having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately. While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. Here ends the Holy Gospel. We confess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing hymn 148, stanzas 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8. Thyself does not strengthen and comfort us. Therefore, dear Father, embrace us, accomplish thy will in us, that we may be, become thy kingdom to thy praise. But, dear Father, strengthen us in this transaction with thy holy word. Give us our daily bread. Establish in our hearts thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, who is the true bread of heaven, that being sustained by him, we may gladly bear and suffer the breaking and mortifying of our own will and the fulfillment of thine. Give grace to all Christendom. Send us educated pastors and preachers who will 
not give us the dregs and chaff of foolish fables, but teach us thy holy gospel and lead us to Christ Jesus. Amen. The text for the sermon is from Jesus' High Priestly Prayer, John chapter 17. We will give the prelude to the particular text beginning in verse 20. John 17, 1 through 6. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. In verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Far our text. Please be seated. We have the privilege of hearing a portion of the conversation of Jesus with his Father on the eve of his crucifixion. It is called his high priestly prayer because priests were to present the needs of the congregation to the Lord. And indeed, just as in his ministry, so as it came to its close, it was the needs of our Lord's brothers and sisters, humanity, which prompted him to look to heaven. We in whom the Holy Spirit forms the mind of Christ marvel at the depth of this communication. <clears throat> it's not easy for a pastor to particularly point out or pick out something particular. Prayer is a wonder in itself that what we say or even think transcends time and space, any known or unknown borders or limits, and is immediately received by him who knows no borders or limits. Now we're told by Paul, and we know by experience, that sometimes we don't even know what to pray. Not so with our Lord Jesus. He knew perfectly what to pray, and the Father understood perfectly what was thought and said. Their communication was perfect. Ours suffers. We don't think alike. The mind of Christ that he gives believers must fight the old man of the flesh. Moses found out that his communication wasn't really readily accepted. He told his fellow slaves what God told him. I have established my covenant with you to give you the land of Canaan. 
I am the Lord who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. But they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Anguish within, cruelty without, yet in the way of communication. So ours is either too soft and lazy, or it's too hard, or vindictive, or blaming. And this is what Satan intends. Doubt also gets in the way, as Moses exhibited in his follow-up prayer comment to our Lord. The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh, for I am of uncircumcised lips. And Jesus, God, listen. And whatever our weaknesses, whatever our enemies and their strength, God communicates to us what is good and then makes it happen. Thus, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and I'll add again, gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh to bring his children out of the land of Egypt. And it happened. And now, in the upper room, heading toward Gethsemane, God was about to bring his children out from under their Satan and death and hell. And in trying to understand and grasp Jesus' prayer, 26 verses long. I, I looked at the whole section and identified what I thought were 33 key words, key concepts and teachings from Alpha to Omega, from accomplish to world. And this is what one would expect. A lot of theology exchange between God on earth and God the Father in heaven. 17 of these key words are used a total of 44 times in the seven verses which make up the end of his prayer, which make up our text. The text begins in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, these being those who have followed him up to Jerusalem from Galilee, those who had helped him, those who wept and mourned the next day and for months following when the king of Israel was crucified by Israel the apostolic generation I do not pray for these alone but I pray also for those that will believe in me through their word that they all may be one those who will believe Jesus prayed for you the New Testament believer, for us, the New Testament church. Pray is one of the key words along with believe, word, one. Now here, Jesus affirmed that his word of life would remain until the end. Since the end hasn't come, there are still some who will believe, and it'll be because people and pastors like us carry with us the word. Now it remains a question among sectarian Christians just how conversion is affected. It was not a question for Jesus or for Lutherans. I pray for those who will believe in me through their words. We believe that the word is a means of grace, means used by the Holy Spirit to the end that we believe we are saved by God's choice, a salvation from death and Satan, affected by Jesus' submission to our guilt and to our punishment. Now, since conversion isn't amorphous, it doesn't come out of the blue, but is accomplished by the tangible word, so salvation itself isn't some the philosophic principle, isn't dependent on us. The grace of God has a date stamp, a place stamp, 
a name stamp. Spring, 33 AD, place of the skull and the garden tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and Jesus of Nazareth, crucified and returned to life. This grace of God is real. And it's packed like confetti in a pressurized canister. Grace carried, sprouted out by words made alive by the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke of people yet to believe, who would believe, and that they do believe he has kept us alive. And we are going to have as difficult almost a time as Moses did with a hardened Pharaoh, with people who need more than one explanation or one moment to get over the blows and the skepticism that the world has beat into them. But remember, Jesus promised who will believe. Remember that the Pharaoh did release his prisoners because he could not prevail against God's choice. In one verse, we fleshed out a few of the key words in Jesus' perfect prayer to him who hears perfectly. And we find out his prayer isn't about protection of himself, principles of justice, end to war, resolution of sexually based discrimination. He asked, and the Father has granted that there be relief for our sin through the word. And as a result, the next verse, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. And here, another key word, one. Twelve times in our seven verses. One. People are swayed to think as our Creator does. And we become one. Unity with believers before us, believers around us, after us, and with him who is three in one, is both a reality and a goal. And it remains a goal for the reasons I just pointed out, that some Christians will not say that there are means of grace. It remains a goal because even husbands and wives can't communicate the way we should, the way we would like or won't communicate. So Jesus prayed, they all may be one. He experienced, was greatly annoyed at the Pharaohs and the Pharisees who refused the good news. And so he prayed may, which means there is no given. That telling Bible truth always means a Bible belief. But it can't. Jesus says it will, sometimes. Jesus knows, knew then, of the hairline fractures of his church. Knows that some of us no longer in, are in this or that synod or group. That oneness is always precious and is always threatened. But yet there remains oneness as fact. That there is a church we can't see, but we can define. It's all and everyone with trust, instilled by the Holy Spirit, that Jesus has saved us from the end of our guilt and has promised us a home called heaven. Three times in his prayer, including in our text, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me. Which is, to be with Jesus is to be in heaven. Keywords include pray, believe, word, given. Along with this oneness worked by the Holy Spirit, worked through a common confession which our fathers put down in three simple we call them ecumenical creeds. But any who step away from what is said in the creeds endangers himself. 
But in those creeds, whatever oneness the Holy Spirit helps us exhibit on earth, it will be, and it is, a blessed reflection of the unity of the Father with his Son. A unity that carried over and was not diminished when he became man. There was no disunity introduced when God adopted a genome, became son of Mary. The Father remained in him, except when he was on the cross. Now as a man heavy with our sin, hung on him like a millstone, he prayed that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they, New Testament believers, may also be one in us. So his human mission to experience divine wrath and calm it by his sacrifice and conquer it by loving his enemies. This was not destructive of God's will. It was his Father's will. Thus you have entered into Jesus' suffering and the benefits of his resurrection in baptism. That you have been identified with the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And where it happened was right here in a place like this amongst Christians. So it's more important in these places than anywhere else that you can be on a Sunday. And by being here, great things happen, not just to you. It can have the end for which Jesus prayed, that the world may believe that you have sent me. How will anyone believe if you stay away from worship? or join the world in some other activity. There are two more key words in just these verses. World and sent. Now at times in his prayer, world means our third enemy. The anti-Christian influences that are around us, the doctrines Doctrines that oppose the word. Sometimes the world, as a term, means those of the world whom Satan still keeps as his, who either by default or consciously insult the biblical God. Sometimes world simply means this place called earth. Here, World, that the world may believe, means humankind. Each one of us starting out as unbelievers. Jesus prayed for the opposite. And the Christian unity. And our unity is not outwardly perfect. But yet would still be dramatic to a world defined by disunity. That the world may believe <clears throat> is a promise that wherever believers gather, in that place the world can see God's influence. The influence of the Holy Spirit is there. And such influence we can see in the Exodus history of people around and about God's work. When he sent the ten plagues. Everybody heard about it all around. When he gave the ten commandments as terms of their adoption, I redeemed you, and so you should try to live as I want. All the nations around about heard about this. Not many submitted to or even tried to help Israel on the way to the promised land, but no matter. God helped them, even when Israel fulfilled the sword for herself. And they did it. See, our influence is more than what we might think. And Jesus wants the world to believe that the Father sent me. No man sourced from human flesh can deliver his brother. Jesus was sent from above. Even Moses doubted God's persuasive ability, but Jesus never did. 
Jesus insisted time and again that he had come from the Father to do, complete the Father's will. And he prayed the same several times in our seven verses that individuals and his people as a whole come to a full accord and for the same end or purpose that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. How wonderful to think that we are a testament to divine love. Every believer, every baptism, so that the world may know. We don't retreat into a monastery or the shadows. We might someday be forced into the corner, but even that fact that the world makes a distinction testifies that we are distinct, unique, just as our God is. And of course, God is uniquely unique, three in one. Christ said, the glory which you, Father, gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are. Glory is a key word used twice in our few verses. Glory is the domain of the divine. Isaiah voiced the Lord's unique claim to glory when Israel was starting to slip in the names of other gods into its vocabulary. And God said, I will give my glory to no other. And so when Jesus affirmed glory, and in verse 5, with the glory that I had with you before the world was, he was affirming his divinity. And yet he never spoke of his glory or his divinity in a way that left out the honor due to his Father, who begat him. And all the more now, as he stood about to enter the garden, ever humble, a son of man about to suffer the sum of all that's wrong with humankind, ready to give up his glory in order to give it to us. Glory would now take an awful shape, a new emoji, if you will, a cross, and this to attain a wonderful end, another emoji, an open tomb. We have glory, but we have no glory apart from Him. In those whom the Father gives to His Son, the Father sees no fault. He holds no grudges. He prepares no punishment. Rather, what He prepares is a home. And just as in His ministry, so as it came to a close, it was this need for restoration of His brothers and sisters which prompted Him to look up to heaven. And he prayed about the gathering there. And it is his prayer in that hope. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. Amen. Love like God has no end. And thus, neither do we. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
Please stand for prayer. Blessed art thou, O Lord, and blessed is thy name forever, who sendest thy word like the dew of the morning, especially in this latter day, when thou hast raised from the dead thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we are heard. O God, we praise and thank thee that thou hast not dealt with us after our sin. Out of thine unspeakable grace, thou didst give thine only begotten Son to be made sin for us to suffer for our transgressions. And we bless and praise thee that through him we are delivered from the bondage of the law into the glorious liberty of thy sons, having access boldly to thy throne of grace, there to obtain mercy. And so grant that we who are here gathered for thy worship may forsake all evil thoughts and ways and pursue with diligence and patience thy holy ways, walking by faith through the valley of the shadow of death. And as thou, O Lord, knew the needs of all men, giving both the righteous and the ungodly their daily bread, make us to receive thy benefits with thanksgiving. O Lord, keep us in faith, not in health of, of mind and body, through him whom thou hast sent into the world, our advocate Jesus. Cause thy gospel to be preached in all lands. Unite the church on earth with Jesus Christ in the one true faith, and unite us with congregations who remain as thy remnant. Hinder the collectivist ideas that glorify man and his potential. And by thy judgments that thou dost allow to fall on sinful man, through those authorities who rule, govern, and legislate what is immoral and harmful, or through sickness or storm, draw us to our knees in repentance and fervent prayer, that we might better cherish those sacred things that set our spirits free, and which will at last allow thy church to continue in peace forever with thee. Bless our schools, give wisdom and counsel to governors, to all who suffer sickness, pain, disease, affliction, abuse, grief, addiction, or any adversity of body, mind, or spirit, give thou the strength that shall enable them to bear their hardship and give to them the spirit of him who taught us to say, thy will be done. And bring a spirit of compromise and forgiveness to husbands and wives, that vows be remembered and recommitted to. In Jesus' glorious name and for his kingdom's sake, we pray these things. Amen. We sing hymn 324. Stands up 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7.
hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, who on the tree of the cross did give salvation unto mankind, that whence death arose, thence life also might rise again, and that he who by a tree once overcame might likewise by a tree be overcome, through Christ our Lord, through whom with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Christ, which was given into death for your sins. 
Take, eat the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sin. Drink the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, blood shed for you, for the remission of your sins. Take drink the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, for the remission of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, for the remission of your sins. Take drink the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, for the remission of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of our Lord shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take drink the blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you for the remission <coughs> of your sins. And now may this body and this blood strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Stand for the Nyctimentus. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. We sing him 374.
Bless we the Lord. Bless me to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Yeah, yeah. 
She was so calm and yeah, yeah. You know, her, her touch was very gentle and very personable, so it was a good experience. Yeah, like I was talking to say, so if you're going to get one six yeah. weeks ago, it's very good. Yeah. That's kind of a life changing experience, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 that's it. Yeah. Yeah, they should have left it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So yeah, well, I was getting a need for that. Three quarters of the same time. Uh -huh. yeah, kind of broke into your first book or second book. They'll stop. They'll be okay at that. Yeah. 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 This first two movies we can use the second book. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got one more second book. So he's going to do that. It's just not one of those two first books. chocolate that I could purchase yeah. with the money I had and stuffed it in my bag. So she opens the bag and the chocolate comes <laughs> pouring. <laughs> and she was like, oh. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was chocolate. <laughs> It was Look, this doesn't prove you're not a bomber. Yes. <laughs> but you have good taste in chocolate. Exactly. Yep. Oh. I'm not going to hold it against you this time. <laughs> and it was completely a random check. Yeah. She was very sweet. So, yeah. In San Jose or? Yep, that was the San Jose airport. Oh. So it was, I was really But I would have been wondered if they would have kept the chain. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay another week. Oh, gee, well, I guarantee it's been dry. Okay. Uh, the, 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
there was a block, they were blocked, so there was a, uh, they were stuck on oh, um, the uh, thing. Whereas, like, I'm going on. <laughs> exactly, it was voice And it was, they were stuck up there, so of course, they had to the tease me. It's your bay. <laughs> yeah. Stuck up it was blocked. It wasn't the first one down, so I voted for it. This word of wisdom is from my wife. Oh, no. She got it from somebody. <laughs> all will be well in the end. If all is not well, it is not the end. That's good Christian theology also. Uh, we are studying music because uh, one of my daughters got me a book about real music, a guide to timeless hymns of the church. And we are, of course, a conservative, uh, how would you say, historic in the sense that we have the liturgy that our folks had, uh, and the, most of the hymns now we're going on uh, how many generations since TLH? Three or four or five. Um, and those hymns were sung way back, you know, some of them. Uh, not that we don't uh, appreciate new liturgy or new arrangements or new hymns, but uh, traditional hymns are hard to be in their scholarship and in their music. And so last week we began uh, with some quotes from Dr. Luther and then some Bible passages dealing with music. Uh, just a, another quote from Luther. Music is God's great gift. It has so often stimulated and stirred me that I felt the desire to preach, to proclaim. You know, that joyous uh, feeling that we sometimes get. <coughs> and music stimulates it. The notes can make the words come alive. It puts to flight every spirit of sadness, as is written of Saul, when David came with his music, his harp. So we're going to continue on, and we're going to cover a few verses that we did last time. And I'm going to use just the music section in uh, the New Nave's topical Bible. So if there's a topic here, you read uh, various verses that would go along with that or sections. Exodus 15. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. 
And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a chim timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with trimble, trim timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, saying, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Uh, music really integral to God's people. And this was before God's people really had been formally adopted, which came when God gave the commands on Mount Sinai, but uh, it was in progress as God brought them out through the Red Sea, and uh, they sang, spoke, probably with songs that they had known before, but new ones there too. 1 Samuel 18, verse 6 and 7. And it came to pass as they came, when da David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And what they sang is Hebrew poetry. It doesn't rhyme so much in... It does in Hebrew meter, in uh, the composition of Hebrew words, which we can't really duplicate in English, so we can't rhyme as the Hebrews did. But Hebrew rhyme in, in their particular meter and also in that it says one thing and the next verse it... it says it again in a little different language or figurative language. It's called parallelism. Uh, and uh, so David comes back, he's killed Goliath, the Philistines aren't a threat as much anymore. The women come out, not because David was you know, good looking, which he probably was, according to the sculpture in way, but um, their men were coming back. This was a joyous time, and they were most of them were alive because David slaughtered the Philistines, and they were free. And they come out and uh, with song and music, answered one another, not a round, but a responsive, uh, uh, form of, of song. Uh, we have it in some of our hymns. Uh, one side of the page is sung by this group and the other side is a response maybe sung by another group or whatever. Uh, so a response, and we have it in our liturgy. We have a responsive liturgy. I speak, you know, on God's behalf often, and you, you respond, and sometimes in song, too. So Lutherans, our, our liturgy, we're highly responsive in, in how we worship. Uh, 1 Kings 1.40 I am uh, 1 Kings 1.40, okay and all the people came up after him and this is at Solomon's coronation King David's son all the people came up after him and the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth rent with the sound of them probably figurative kind of earth rent but meaning it was just so so grand pipes and joy first chronicles 15 16 to 22 and david spake to the chief of the levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music psalteries and harps and cymbals sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of the sons of Mer Merari, their brethren, Ethan, the son of Cushnaiah. Well, these names, uh, Heman, Asaph, Ethan, I think, at least Asaph, uh, is the author of some of the Psalms.
And Chenaniah, chief of the Levites, was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skillful. He was in charge and probably the teacher. You know, rhythm and, and music might be innate in our in our psyche. We're appreciative of it, but <laughs> to play it well, you know, you need teachers. And God gives them. They're a gift to the church also, musicians. And first Corinth, first Chronicles 25, 1 and 5 through 8. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, and with psalms. And God gave to Heman fourteen sons and three daughters. All these were under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord with cymbals, psalteries, and harps. Interesting that uh, here the trans English translators, uh, the King James Version, uh, these musicians prophesy with harps, psalteries, and with cymbals. Uh, interesting way to, to look at uh, spiritual music, church music, as, as prophecy. As, and prophecy is proclaiming the glory of God, really, in its essence. So I'm not, uh, here it doesn't necessarily mean that these musicians spoke in, in prophetic ways or in proclamation ways, but their music spoke. Uh, if you remember the jazz, the song by Carol King, "Jazz Man," uh, there were the saxophones testifying. She says, uh, "The intensity of music and, and the value of music uh, said in this uh, intense way, you know, this marked way, testifying, prophesying." Then we know to uh, Heman's 14 sons and three daughters, and we're going to give a thumbs up to Mrs. 17 kids. But three daughters, all these were under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord. We think that maybe women were left out, but, but they weren't in, especially in, in this talent. So now we're coming to the uh, end of the, cap the captivity of Judah in Babylon. Cyrus lets them go back, gives them money and supplies, and says, go back and build Jerusalem. And they do first Ezra, uh, chapter 2. And there were among them who came back 200 singing men and singing women. So... Uh, whether, they, whether that was their profession or whether this was uh, you know, their, them being chosen for, you know, not professionally, but for their talent, I don't know. Again, men and women. Yeah. God made men and women with different voices, different mm -hmm. other ways too, all for his glory. And then Ezra, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David. And then comes Nehemiah. Uh, first, they laid the foundation and built the temple. Uh, Nehemiah comes along, and at the dedication of the wall, then goes the houses in the wall, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and with singing with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. Nehemiah chapter 12. Uh, 
Psalm 87, a psalm about Zion, the city of God, the, the church in, in our thinking, our New Testament way of thinking. As well the singers as the players on instruments shall be there. And then to, to God and to for thanks for the city of God, all my springs are in thee. So in envisioning the, uh, the perfect uh, shelter, harbor, haven of the church, you picture as so much does, singers and players shall be there. Psalm 92. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. Psalm 92. Some of these words have found their way into our liturgies. Uh, not any more new, but Lutheran worship, which we have, uh, uses Psalm 95. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him the psalms. Psalm 98 is one of our uh, canticles, the end of, Luther, of TLH. There's some hymns, no, excuse me, psalms set to music. This is the Cantate Domino, uh, Psalm 98, or sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. And then it goes on. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a song, with trumpets and sound of cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Etc. This Psalm uh, 137. By the rivers of Babylon, our captors, in captivity, there we sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they, our captors, carried us away captive and required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her coming. <clears throat> if I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Let my right hand forget her cunning. If I forget Jerusalem, why do I need music? I'll cut off my hand which, by which I play. And here, uh, the psalmist, I think, suggests to us that we maintain a distinction between the songs of mirth and that we would sing in the world and those that are, are, are sanctified music. We'll sing of the temple of the Lord, but only when we get to the temple of the Lord. The world doesn't appreciate it. Uh, but the world has its own songs and they have their own religious songs and Isaiah says as much the harp and the viol, the tabre and the pipe and wine are in their feasts the uh, pagan feasts and you know there's nothing I like secular music and uh at feasts, it's good to have music uh, of one kind or another. Uh, we won't begrudge the world of, of their music. Of course, a lot of it we wouldn't care about and don't want to listen to. And uh, 
again, like I mentioned last uh, time, uh, quite a few places in Scripture. Isaiah here, chapter 24, Ezekiel chapter 26, Revelation. Uh, we're not going to begrudge the world music because if they remain in the world, then they won't have any more forever. The mirth of Tabaret ceaseth, ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth. They shall not drink wine with a song, the absence of music figurative for, for judgment, or judgment figuratively described by the lack of music. Again, Ezekiel, and I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harps shall be not heard. Uh, interesting in, now into the New, New Testament, uh, and we have those uh, verses of, of, of Paul, I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with understanding, I will, will speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you, teaching and admonishing with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, those kind of references. Uh, but here's one uh, uh, from Hebrews chapter 2, 12, and it quotes Psalm 22, the messianic psalm, which is very vivid in describing Jesus' suffering. Uh, uh, here, Hebrews 2, 12, regarding the incarnation and the ministry of our Lord, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And so in Hebrews, it's going back to Psalms and saying, you know, our Christ was prophesied. His ministry was prophesied. It fulfills this Psalm 22, verse 22 of the declaring of God's name to his brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. Jesus sang a psalm as they went out from the Garden of Gethsemane, along with the disciples. I'm sure he taught psalms and sang. Uh, and it's curious to know how his singing voice was. But here, the, the verse is used in the sense of Jesus' ministry and the proclamation of, uh, that would uh, extol his Father and salvation. Again, in, in Revelation 18, heaven, I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song, and the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be That's a, shall be heard no more, so those are opposite. One is <laughs> gospel, the other law. But they sung a new song. Paul says words can't describe, and nor am I allowed to use what I saw or what will be. It's going to be new. Anthony Esselen, E-S-O-L-E-N, A Guide to the Timeless Hymns of the Church. The King James Version is not a canonical text. He's a Catholic. They have a canonical text. They, they use the the Vulgate uh, Latin translation for their English Bibles. But as an English translation, the King James Version is incomparable for its beauty and its influence upon poets and hymnists. Hymnodists. Hymnodists. H-Y-M-N-O-D-I-S-T-S. Hymnodists. Hymnodists. You know, and a lot of our great English hymns, of course, were made when there was no New King James Version or really any other popular English version. 
I will be using it throughout for the simple reason the authors of the hymns used it or had its phrasings and its rhythms in mind when they wrote. It will help us see and hear what the poets were doing, and I hope that will in turn inspire poets to uh, do likewise. Introduction. He who sings prays twice, says St. Augustine. Uh, with the mind, I suppose, and then with the mouth. See that panel on the front of the altar, said my friend, the priest, pointing to a wooden relief sculpture of the Lamb of God. You won't believe where I found it. It was in the basement of a tavern. It had been torn out of some church somewhere, and I have no idea how it ended up where it did. We asked for it for the church. If you look hard, you can faintly see a seam across the sculpture where it had been split in two, Father explained. The rest of the church was grand, filled with impressive works of art in stone and glass. The parish was too poor in the 1970s to afford any renovation, but the art survived, he said. Richer parishes were not so fortunate. My own home church, St. Thomas Aquinas, was built by Irish coal miners in the 19th century. They built a large neo-Romanesque structure, one great barrel vault without internal supports. The ceiling entirely open was covered with paintings executed by an Italian they hired and brought over from Europe. No square foot was left blank, not even the area between the stained glass windows and the arc of the ceiling. There were painted medallions of ten of the twelve apostles five on each side, with large hanging medallions of St. Peter and St. Paul in the sanctuary. The background was a warm, muted purple decorated with golden fluid in it. But the wave of new iconoclasm hit. What is an iconoclast? It's someone who literally breaks with icons, with traditional things. And it's usually in a pejorative sense. Most of the ceiling survived, but Peter and Paul disappeared, leaving the church in the absurd position of commemorating the ten apostles, bereft of their chief and of their great apostle to the Gentiles. The delicate background was painted over in icy white. The marble communion rail and the great altar met the jackhammer. The organ in the loft was removed, and no one knows in what landfill its hundreds of pipes have been crushed. Almost every parish in the United States and Canada has such a story. A priest instructs workmen to take away the statues of saints and throw them in the pond. A bishop orders the removal of wooden pews, boasting hand-carved reliefs of the local Appalachian flora and fauna. What is harder to notice, though, is that the same rage for reduction and removal did its work on the very prayers of the church. Yeah, the prayers of the church include him. It is easy for someone to notice the emptiness of a large sanctuary whose dimensions were set precisely for the altar that used to be there. It is harder to notice words no longer spoken, or melodies no longer heard. I am writing this book to bring back the words of great Christian hymns, most of which are no longer heard anywhere. These hymns are not pious sentiments, or worse, self-celebrating sentiments, or social propaganda, set to a catchy tune. They are works of art. They are, at their best, profound meditations upon the meaning of Scripture, their artistry serving to help us to see truths we may have missed or to hear in our hearts, not only in our ears, the implications of the Word of God for our lives. They are verbal and melodic icons of Jesus Christ. I spent my entire adult life teaching poetry to college students. It is a joy for me to see their eyes open with wonder when they hear the art of poetry for the first time. It certainly is a change from the usual. Most of what we see and hear every day is shabby, slovenly, cynical, brazen, or stupid. The modern is either utterly drab or glaring. A school built like a vast warehouse, or an airport filled with visual and auditory noise. When young people encounter poetry, if they will but open themselves up to it, they are like people tasting wine who have known only oily water. It is as if they cry out, here, at last, is something I can give my heart to. The 
church, it is true, offers the incomparable wine of the Eucharist and bread, but she offers it all too often with the carelessness of the drab or the tastelessness of the glaring. And here I return to St. Augustine's saying above, Why do they who sing pray twice? Certainly song requires that we lift up our hearts. Singing is what the lover does, says Augustine. It is one thing to say the words of a psalm, but to sing them means that we cherish them within us and proclaim them with our whole being. And yet this is not simply an emotional outburst. The hymns that Augustine heard when he was still an unbeliever, and that he sang out in devotion once he had given his life to Christ, were works of theological art. That is to say, human intelligence and the divine teachings are woven together in a sacrifice of praise, just as Abel chose the best of his flocks to sacrifice to the Lord. And they do so in a memorable way, he underlines memorable. Music and poetry help to form the Christian imagination, resonating in the heart long after we have left the doors of the church as we sing, Pleasant are thy courts above, O Lord of hosts. I wish then to reintroduce this human and divine poetry to my fellow Christians to show them how the great hymn poems work and what they have to teach us. May the Lord Jesus, who sang the ancient hymns of his people after his last supper with his friends, be also a friend to us and send us that same spirit who inspired the poets and the composers of our heritage. May we turn in gratitude to the turn in gratitude to the work they did. Few churches can afford a Caravaggio or a Rembrandt, but all can afford a Bach or a Handel. The music is there to be heard, the poetry there to be sung. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Uh, yeah, I gave you the sheet on trying to preach on the high priestly prayer. Where do you begin? Where do you end? And what should you do? I just wanted to flesh out that mm -hmm. prayer with things that struck me. These words were a way to do it. Mm -hmm.